the challenge as we know it coming to life before our eyes. The Godfather is here. Beth is here. We've got daily challenges. We've got romances. We've got physicality injuries. We've got trips to Vegas and the Playboy Mansion back to back. We've got real worlders on one side, road rulers on the other, battling it out for $50,000 in cash prizes. Add that all up. And we've got the Season 2 Real World Road Rules Challenge, the full season recap, coming up right now. What up, my fellow challenge lovers? Welcome to the Challenge Historian, where we dive deep into all things the challenge, past, present, or future. If it's happening in the Challenge Universe, then we are here to document it. I am your host and dedicated Challenge Historian, Jacob Hollibaugh. Thank you so very much for being here, listening with us today. On today's podcast, we are visiting the Museum of Challenge History to study, analyze, discuss, and rate another historic season of the Challenge. That would be season number two. Real World Road Rules Challenge. Some say the verses. I don't, but either way, it's the second season of the show we love, or maybe it's not, because maybe you consider it the first season, as I kind of do more on that soon enough. But it's our second installment in the 2022 Challenge Series Rewatch Series. Hadn't said that out loud before, but kind of sounds a little silly now with that same word back to back. But anyways, moving on. That's the sole purpose of today's pod, to break down this wonderful and bordering on iconic season of the show we love. Before we do, a couple housekeeping notes. First, for the second of two podcasts in this so far two podcast rewatch series, I am coming to you later than promised. If your opinion of me and my word on when podcasts will be released doesn't now mirror your opinion of Kyle keeping his word to an alliance, then I don't know what to tell you. Like Kyle, I really do try, I swear. But sometimes you just accidentally put the kill pill on your number one ally, you know? It just it just kind of happens. You don't you kind of black out, you forget what you're doing, and then boom, now you've made someone really mad and you've went against your promises. But in all seriousness, these are already uh taking longer than anticipated to watch the whole season, you know, full season, recap them, um, put together a bunch of content clips, this, that, and the other, document the whole thing and I've only done the two seasons that are only two hours long in runtime. When they start to be 20 hours long, I am probably completely and utterly fucked. Regardless, I will do my best, uh, absolute best, to keep this two-season-a-week plan in place for now. So next week, we will have seasons three and four on Monday and Thursday, respectively. And if you don't, and if I don't, not you, I don't, you can just keep throwing me into whatever the podcast version of Eliminations are. And like Kyle, I will hopefully just keep coming back and back and back into your feed whenever that may be. Elsewhere, remember that if you want even more detail and to see some of the clips of the moments and the quotes and the things that we'll be talking about on today's podcast, then head on over to our Instagram page at Challenge Historian. Or if Twitter is your bag, follow me at Jacob Hollaball, spelling in the show notes for those episodic recaps. We're posting a bunch of stuff on Twitter and Instagram, a bunch of the clips we're going to talk about today and many, many more. Every single episode is being covered on those channels. If you want the deepest of deep dive details, that's where you want to be. Final reminder then, because I can't seem to stop a few folks from asking every time I post something about these early seasons. I'm sure it's going to keep happening all the way through season nine. I'm sorry. These seasons are not publicly available to my knowledge. A few of them, uh, this current one we're talking about today, not one of those, but a few of season one through nine are available out there if you're willing to search the internet a little bit. Um, but otherwise they're, they're not available starting with season 10. They are on Paramount plus, um, I wish they were, I can't share my versions of them that I am watching at the moment because you know, laws and stuff like that. I wish I could, the clips are the best I can do. So if, uh, if you're desperate to watch one of these seasons, I was right there with you. I'm still right there with you. I'm not going to have access to these forever. I'm and I'm going to be wishing and wishing and wishing right with you that they are up on Paramount Plus. I don't know why they are not. It doesn't make any sense that every single season is on there, especially since some of the ones that are on there are some of the ones that have some of the more controversial moments in them, as we will talk about later. These early seasons so far, one and two, 
not really anything that ages all that poorly or bad or anything. I don't, I don't get why they can't be on there. So hopefully they will be soon. I am sorry that they are not now. The best you've got is, you know, clips here and there. Occasionally, again, search the internet, certain seasons, particularly uh, five, seven, eight, and nine, I think are currently available somewhere out there on the interwebs, but they come and go from time to time. So who knows? But, uh, you know, I'm doing the best I can here. Sorry about all that. And, uh, you know, if you keep asking the questions, I'll keep trying to answer it the best I can, which isn't a very good answer. So with that, let's dive into season two. Real World Road Rules Challenge. Our agenda for today is as follows. We will start with the state of the challenge heading into this season, then basic info and stats from this season. Then we will break down the major storyline of the season, the story of the season, plus some kind of secondary ones. What age the best and worst? Then we'll hand out awards for the best quote, the best daily challenge, the best moment of the season, and the best episode of this six-episode run. And then, of course, our season MVP in the overall season grade. Where does it fall on the rankings as we move forward and look back at every single season of the challenge? Where will this one stack up with the rest? We will get to all of that very, very soon, starting pretty much right now. So if you are ready, I am ready. Let's go. The year's 1999. What is the state of the challenge at this point? So uh, the real state is uh, that it's launching for real. This is kind of actually season one, as we discussed at length on the last podcast episode where we covered actual season one, Road Rules All-Stars. That wasn't really the challenge it's just kind of retroactively been fitted as, yeah, that's the origin of the franchise. And of course, because MTV considers it season one and bases a bunch of other things off it, like the epi- how many episodes are, you know, we celebrate the 500th episode, 30th season with Dirty 30, you know, naming all that, all that good stuff. It has to be considered number one, no matter what your feelings are on it. But this season, season two, Road Rule, Real World Road Rules, The Challenge, is much more kind of like the first season of the challenge. It's obviously the first one with challenge in the name. Um, It is, while the season one has real worlders performing a road rules season, so both shows are in the mix. This is the first one with both show alumni in the mix. We got real world on one side, road rules on the other. We have, for the first time, winners and losers, which is a big Uh, divergent from the first season where it's just one small little crew playing again, playing a road rules game, even a condensed road rules game where they just win one prize as a group at the end. This one, there's winners and losers. Everyone gets some money in the end, but one team gets a whole lot more. They actually do daily challenges. So it feels a lot more like the challenge. This kind of is the real launch of the franchise and is the big moment of, you know, when you do a spinoff, as we've seen with a couple other spinoffs that'll come later in the challenge history here. But they do a spinoff of Road Rules. They're hoping maybe this spinoff can be a thing for a couple of shows here or there. But then when you get to season two of the spinoff and you decide, hey, that kind of worked and we're going to do it again, but we're going to do it again with the intention of trying to maybe do it a bunch of times, that's when it really becomes something. So, um, you know, This season is still road rule style as far as the travel and the fact that there's no eliminations. um, So everyone stays for the entirety of the season. Um, So we're not all the way there to the challenge, but this feels like the challenge when you watch it. It definitely, you know, even if some, if you were someone that has only, you know, gotten into the challenge much more recently, the last few seasons or dozen seasons or whatever, if you were to go back and watch this, very much feels like, okay, I see, I see the structure. I see the bones of the challenge. And I would get that this is the 1999 version of the show. We're still watching in 2022. So I get that. The other part of the state of the challenge is could it launch a franchise? Could it truly, could this be not just a spinoff that has a couple of seasons, but could this be a long running thing? The way the real world at this point is just on top of the world, literally is just a behemoth. And the road rules is a very, very, very successful franchise. Those two are running real smooth road rules, a little bit dying out real world. Kind of not at all at this point is just literally hitting its peak and stride at this point in time. Uh, could it, this though launch a new third franchise and officially establish something where you could take alumni from these other two shows and bring them into this other world and get them back on our screens over and over and over and be kind of a step two in a career on MTV. 
Um, who knows going into this if they if they knew, you know, prior to the season that this was going to totally work and launch a long term thing. You know, they definitely weren't thinking thirty seven plus seasons plus spin off here, there, and everywhere. But were they thinking? You know, this is a thing, and we're confident going in that if we put people from real world road rules that people loved once, we put them on this new thing, and we're going to get six, seven, eight, nine, ten seasons out of this. We're going to keep feeding this over and over. It, it seems like the idea of, of multiple seasons had to be there from the start, that they, they kind of knew they had struck gold with both of the two franchises, real world and road rules, and that now this was their chance to mine that gold for more than the one season that each of those people was on those respective shows. So that's where the franchise is at this point. It's not a franchise. It's a budding. The seed was planted. And now officially this, this season's kind of like that seed is getting watered and there's, there's some roots sprouting out. They're still below ground. We don't totally see them yet from the outside, but they're there and they're starting to grow faster and faster by the episode. And there's a lot more going on underneath that soil than we could ever, ever fathom as far as what is to grow from that little sprouting seed. So that is the state of the challenge. So that's where we're at going into the season. Now let's actually talk about the season itself. So to do that first, we got to cover the basics. We got to cover just some of the basic stats and facts coming out of this season. So let's do that now. Season basics. Let's run through it real quick before we dive into the meat of what actually goes down, the best, the worst, everything in between. So first and foremost, this airs season two, Real World Road Rules Challenge. That is the official, official name. Sometimes Real World versus Road Rules, The Challenge, whatever you want to call it, RW times RR, whatever, Real World Road Rules Challenge season two. It aired November 9th to December 14th, 1999, Y2K, here we come. Locations, three of them. Again, this was Road Rules style. They were in well, one team was in a Winnebago basically the entire time. That was real world. The other team was in a very nice tour bus the entire time. That would be road rules. But they start in San Francisco. They go to Los Angeles. They go over to Las Vegas. They come back to Los Angeles at the end. So pretty much just California. They don't get to quite go on the globetrotting adventure that those folks in season one or that most road rule seasons kind of take. But they still do travel around the big old state of California, and so there is still some bones of that road rules travel in there. Cast members, real quick run through of everyone on the cast. Got to pull up the proper list here to do that. So we've got 12 people, and Team Real World split up into Real World and Road Rules. Team Real World's got Beth from Real World LA, Janet from Real World Seattle, Jason and Montana from Real World Boston, Nathan from Real World Seattle, Neil from Real World London, and over on the Road Rules team, they got Annie from Road Rules Northern Trail, Callie from Islands, Kefla from Down Under, Mark Long, the Godfather is here from USA, The First Adventure, and Noah and Ronnie from Northern Trail as well. So three Northern Trail alumni coming in, two Real World Boston coming in, and then one guest appearance from the man himself, Cyrus, Real World Boston, also makes one brief appearance, uh, an appearance that uh, will be a moment we talk about at length during this podcast. So 12 cast members, a 13th makes a guest appearance and is also hosted by David Edwards from Real World LA. He is referred to as Mr. Big. And as I mentioned in the season one recap, not a big fan of the whole Mr. Big concept necessarily. Uh, David gets a lot more screen time in this season than Puck did on season one. Uh, he's in, you know, around for three to four, even of the episodes, two or three at least, um, pops up here and there is providing the clues via voiceover and stuff like that. Um, he is around... I am not someone familiar with real world LA other than the wonderful Beth and John and others that have come from it into the challenge world. But I do know, and David outwardly celebrates on the show that he was kicked off real world LA and then immediately brought on to host this new show. So interesting decision there by MTV to say the least prize money for the show was just shy of $53,000. They say at the beginning that $50,000 are up for grabs. Um, it ends up being a total of $53,000 in the end because there is one little mini side challenge that wins routine real world, a bonus three K 
as for the stats this season, so that's the that's the basics. Who's on it? Who's hosting it? Where it is? When it aired? As for the quick basic stats to just kind of wrap your mind around what happened from an actual game standpoint on this season before we dive into some actual storylines here. First and foremost, confessionals. Obviously, well, first, no one gets kicked off this season, so everyone makes six appearances. Everyone of this 12-person cast, six episodes to their name. Confessional standpoint, Jason and Neil dominate this season from a, a talking standpoint, a confessional standpoint, with 29 each over the six episodes. Montana and Nathan are a little ways behind them at 23. The next highest beyond that is Janet at 17, and then it drop, keeps dropping off very, very quickly. So this season really from, at least from the confessional booth, voiceover kind of standpoint, is really narrated by Neil and Jason. They are kind of always a part of more or less everything that's going on. Um, Nathan and Montana kind of coming up right behind them, also making a heavy impact in the confessional booth. As for the daily challenges, Road Rules dominates this season in a big, big way. They win four out of the five. The real world team does win the one mini challenge, or well, I, I, technically there's four mini challenges, and but one of them has a cash prize. I don't count the little mini challenges as a daily challenge in any way. Um, I only count the actual the missions, quote unquote. They're still called missions in this in this season uh, as a daily challenge. So there's five of them for real, five of them that are worth a minute in the money chamber at the end. So four for the real world six, excuse me, road rule six, one for the real world crew. And the big question from a statistical standpoint this season, and kind of one of the biggest questions coming out of it for me from a historical standpoint is, does this count as a win for the road rules team? Because, We'll work our way through storylines, moments, this, that, and the other here momentarily. But the end of the season is that, you know, Road Rules has won four out of the five challenges. They get four minutes inside of a money chamber. The real world only gets one minute in that side of that money chamber where the money's blown up all around them, cash all blown through the air around them. They get to grab it out of the air, stuff it in backpacks for four minutes or one minute. And all the money they get to grab, they get to take home as a team. And so in the end, Road Rules gets more money in the cash grab because they have four times as much time in there from winning four out of the five challenges. They end up all going home with about $6,600. A real world all goes home with $2,200. Technically, MTV, at least, seemingly, and seemingly the fandom as well, from wiki pages to Reddit to most places you look when people reference championships had the easiest... Easiest to look at is, um, just from a historical perspective here, is Mark Long and Beth um, both go on to do a good amount of seasons of the challenge and are really kind of figures of the challenge for a while here. And so when people reflect on them, they definitely count this as a championship for Mark Long. Um, and the rest then, you know, therefore the rest of the Road Rules team. And I'm kind of split on it. I would love to hear people's opinions. If you have a strong opinion one way or the other, I will hopefully maybe post about this on Reddit, but also uh, my Twitter account, my Insta uh, Challenge Story on Instagram, if you want to send some DMs around. If you have a strong opinion one way or the other, should this count as a challenge championship? I'm going to go ahead and for the time being say yes, but uh, with with the ability to retract that at a later date. I would love to hear convincing arguments one way or the other. I am torn, but I'm leaning towards it counts as a challenge championship. It just, you know, is one of those that when people look back on some of the people that have won a bunch of championships over the years and say, well, was that a team or pair or individual? And, you know, want to discount certain ones, you can definitely discount this one pretty pretty heavily, you know, uh, if we were to wait the championships, um, a long time fan here of the Bill Simmons podcast. And he has a great theory on MVPs in major sports leagues that they should be weighted. Some seasons they're worth, you know, much, much more than others. Maybe one season should be a five pound MVP title. Some season should be a 20 pound, whatever. This is definitely, you know, the, the least weighted, uh, championship in in the history of the show, but I am going to count it as a championship. So Ronnie, Noah, Mark, Kefla, Callie, Annie, they all get the first ever challenge championship win for this season, along with those four daily wins as well. So that's your stats. That's your basics of the show. Now we can get into the meat of things, and let's transition into discussing the overarching storyline of the season as well as some secondary ones that popped up here and then. 
The story of the season, unlike season one that didn't really have one overarching story necessarily, this one kind of uh, kind of does. It comes it comes close enough that we can call one story kind of the main storyline versus others being the secondary storyline. The main storyline of the season is that Road Rules takes it a bit more seriously and also has a clear athletic advantage. Real world just kind of wants to have fun, hook up, and talk about life um, and art and everything else. Um, so it's really this this the whole season is road rules kind of dominating real world in every facet while the entire group of them as a collective 12 having a great time and a wonderful life experience together. Uh, it is kind of funny um, going back and watching these these seasons from so long ago with the mindset or the framework of what we have today and especially right now today thinking about the new version, you know, CBS version of the challenge that has been announced and the last, you know, handful of seasons of the regular show, if not 10 plus seasons of the flagship show coming under some scrutiny from Sun fans of being too much of a sport or, you know, the divide between the the kind of athletes and the non-athletes necessarily on the show and how much it can rear its head with certain fan favorites either you know having no shot to go all that far because they just you know aren't there to compete in a football contest away others might be things like that that you would think going back and I definitely thought going back not having a great memory if any of some of these earliest seasons like yeah you know that they're they're silly carnival games that's what a Johnny Bananas that's what a Mark Long himself calls literally I believe when he did the Bananas podcast recently called this particular season, um, you know, that they literally played silly carnival games, but there's a lot of physicality to it. There's a lot of athleticism to it, um, to at least a handful of the missions or daily challenges, if you will, um, including most certainly the very, very first one, the roller derby, which we will be talking about later on, but is brutally physical and athletics are a necessity and there's three of the five missions are very much like which team is are the better athletes that they're going to win this. Um, and it is lamented throughout by real world, especially early on of, you know, they've got the brawn, we've got the brains. And it seems like they've, you know, the producers have made this whole thing about the brawn. And so we're fucked and they kind of are fucked throughout the throughout the whole thing. Um, but everyone has a great time together in this very similar to the first season and very similar to the real world and road rule shows that this spawned out of. We get a, a multiple of the real heavy kind of real life moments, the raw, genuine conversation. And this is, you know, just an unbelievable far cry from the the atmosphere in the environment that the challenge as we know it in 2022 or even in 2018 or 14 or 12 or even really like even earlier in that it, this is just a whole different universe that they are existing in back here again pre not pre cell phone or internet but like pre real cell phones or internet types of stuff situation pre you know, we only we get one hilarious moment um fascinating moment of fame the way in season one we got the one kind of conversation about fame this one we get that kobe bryant is a fan of the <laughs> of the show yes kobe bryant is on this season we will talk a lot about that uh a little ways down the road but uh it's just very raw it's very genuine there's some great conversations have there's some interesting point of views and perspectives brought up and it's a good examination of you know it may be isn't the most diverse swath of people and opinions um, out there in the world amongst the cast, but there is certainly some a diversity of perspective to some degree within the cast, and they are shared, and they learn from each other, and they interact in a very interesting way together. So that is all there. As for some secondary storylines, <laughs> the biggest one that could be, you could argue, is the main story of the season is everyone's in a relationship. And if it was, uh, because there's so many of them, it involves almost everyone. That's why you can almost argue for and against it being the story of the season is the amount of relationships, uh, of the 12 cast members, we get four kind of pseudo relationships, flirtations, interest. We got Janet and 
wait, uh, Janet and Jason. There we go. Two J names here. We get Noah and Montana. We get uh, Kefla and Ronnie, who came into the show with a bit of a relationship from off of the show and continue it on screen. We get Nathan and Callie. And four, I mean, eight, eight out of the 12 people. And we, you know, who knows with the other four, maybe something happened. Maybe it didn't. There was not a lot of camera time to go around between these other four couples kind of having little flirtation. I shouldn't say couples flirtations. Um, Janet and Jason will go ahead and say couple, but the other Ronnie and Kefla also a, a bona fide couple during the season. The other two more flirtations. Will they, won't they, they do, but they don't type of situations, but romance everywhere on this season. The other storyline, secondary storyline, that's very interesting to look back at in in the view now of 2022 All-Stars. Mark Long, the godfather, having brought about with a social movement to create the We Want OGs hashtag, create the movement, and eventually very quickly create the spinoff of the All-Stars show. And now when it's about to air its third season here in a month or two, v- viewed through that, when you look back, you could... the. I've heard a few times, or I guess more seen on Reddit, and occasionally, I think I've even heard remarked on a few podcasts here or there, that Mark Long is unbelievable, love him and everything like that, but why is he like the godfather, This influ- such an outsized influence for the fact that he didn't do that many seasons, at least in comparison to you know where the CTs, Anissa's, Johnny Bananas, Car Maria's of the world eventually would get to, but the reason why he had such staying power, both in reality television and within the challenge community, both fans and cast alike, specifically the cast alike. You see in 2022, the first season of All Stars, when they put it out, not only the power of him to make the whole thing happen in the first place and become the executive producer of the show, but to then on the first season of All Stars, you see just the kind of how everyone looks up to him and in the cast, everyone like looks at him as the person that kind of runs everything that, you know, is in charge that everyone has a complete hundred percent approval rating of. And that is there all the way back in 1999 on this season. While he doesn't really come close to winning the MVP of the season, spoiler alert, it will not be him 11 other people. It could be for that reveal later on, but he is clearly the leader of the 12 person cast as a as a pack mission after mission like when they get to the new place when they pull up to the hard rock hotel he's the one that introduces himself and kind of the whole group to the person that they're meet to meet there he's the one that goes in and says and speaks to Kobe Bryant and Reggie Miller first and last and at at that wonderful unbelievable moment in challenge he is just the one that everyone's kind of looking to on the bus. He's the one that when Beth wants, you know, she's hurt and she wants to ride the nice van with that team, she goes to Mark and asks Mark because he's in charge. That that leadership is clearly there and everyone clearly looks to him as, you know what you're doing. You're a great person. We love you. We're kind of, you're, you're a little bit in charge of this group. We got to have a leader. It's going to be you. So even if it doesn't end up turning into, you know, he's the star of the show, He's the one kind of pulling the strings a little bit even here in this one, and he's the one that everyone kind of looks at as with just the respect and the admiration. So that's there from the beginning. That was fascinating and really, really cool to see that it shows up this early on in his tenure in the MTV world and reality TV world and in the franchise's history. Last thing from a just overall broad storyline perspective is one quick fun fact. There will hopefully be some more fun facts and stats. The deeper into the series we get, the more, you know, the first of this, the fifth time this happened, the this unique thing took place, whatever. The one that we have for this season is that we do officially have our first returning person to some degree, and that is Beth becomes the very first person to appear on two seasons of the show as she did guest appear in one episode of the first season when she hosts the entire cast to stay in her apartment while they're in LA and iconically hits on Sean very, very aggressively in that. So Beth becomes the first person to appear on two seasons of the show well before anyone would make their actual second appearance as a full on cast member of the show. So that's your one little fun fact from the cast in the story of the season. Now, with that, we've we've kind of got an overarching view of what what took place. Road rules dominated. 
Uh, they kind of had the advantage all season long. We know that. We've heard the stats. Let's get into a couple specific topics and awards. Let's start off with discussing what aged the best and what aged the worst. Because as we know, on a show that took place in 1999 and is still running in 2022, and a show that famously has some you know unbelievably amazing human really cool, interesting, fascinating moments to its name, but also has a its handful of pretty big warts and darker moments and low moments and learning moments and things of that nature. We're going to analyze every single season what aged the best and what aged the worst when we look back and what could maybe be cut out if you, uh, if you were doing it all over again and what, surprisingly, has been Fan, could still be received just as fantastically today as it was back then. So let's discuss that now. Let's go best first, worst second. We'll start with the positive. And there are definitely a few things that aged really, really well with this one. The one that we just commented on, so we'll just say it without much comment again here, is Mark Long as the leader. Everything we just said about that and like his kind of position within the cast and how, you know, 23 years later, he's literally the running all-stars as an executive producer and sometimes cast member. So that aged incredibly, incredibly well. Then the surprising aged well from this season is in the end of the fifth episode into the first half of the second episode, uh, the second, sixth episode, sixth and final season finale episode, the cast spends the night at the Playboy Mansion, which if I just told you, you have you don't get a chance to watch this, that in 1999, they sent the 12-person cast of Real World World Rules of the Challenge to the Playboy Mansion for a night, you would probably guess that uh, that's not something that's going to age 100% well, um, that there could very likely have been some stuff that maybe doesn't look great in retrospect. But surprisingly, it all does. There's only one right, right away. There's like one little initial comment that you're like, I feel a little gross about that, but like not. You know, in a like, yeah, they should show it, and everyone in the the rest of the cast and a bunch of the women in the cast are immediately like, that was kind of a little gross, and disgusting, and like you're you're a, you know kind of a pig or whatever you want to say, and so the appropriate reaction to it and whatever, but nothing anything crazy bad that you're like, oh god, that's just really 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 awful that that's there. So one little minor comment aside. Um, you know, this, it actually surprisingly went well. The moment they roll up to the Playboy Mansion, I was just like, oh, this is going to be, this could be really, you know, cringy. I, I don't know what's about to happen, but I, I, I'm i going to try my best to view it through 1999 lens and not 2022 lens. And, you know, I should say, if you're someone that just thinks the entire existence of the Playboy Mansion is horrific um, and, you know, everything about that and the magazine, Hugh Hefner and all that is just, you know, vile or whatever, uh, you that that's your right to that opinion. And you definitely would assume that all of this, no matter what ages horribly, because they do hang out at the Playboy mansion and Hugh Hefner's there. And many of the playmates are there, but surprisingly everything about it is really, really respectful and like good humored entertainment. The cast has a blast having a little pool party of themselves. They, they don't really, with the exception of Noah, who has a legit like four hour long hangout conversation with one of the playmates before it gets blown, his spot gets blown up by Montana in a quick little side swipe negative comment from her as she passes by the duo. Otherwise, everyone's just hanging out with the rest of the cast. They're having a great time. There's a quick appearance by Hugh Hefner, and it, it got it has to go in the age the best category just simply because the moment it came on the screen and I realized that they were going to the Playboy Mansion, I was like, this is this is a surefire winner for Age the Worst, whatever is about to transpire. And surprisingly, and to all their credit, it wasn't. Um, so that, and then we also had, um, you know, just the concept itself of taking the most interesting people from many seasons of successful shows and putting them together and putting road rules and real whirlers together for the first time. That concept obviously aged amazingly as we are on the cusp of a 38th season, a third all-star season, three other spinoff seasons, a challenge CBS launched. Obviously, this idea aged quite, quite well. Final thing that aged well then is... Um, Beth's season in general, and just this being the first season of Beth's uh, challenge career and just the arc that she would go on this season. While I, you know, obviously wish she didn't get hurt, she starts the season by getting hurt, 
in the very first uh, challenge, the roller derby challenge, and then the rest of the season. Some of the challenges she could do, some of them she can't, and her injury is a nagging thing on her team the entire time. She is way more of a team player in this one. She's lovely. She's wonderful. She seems nice. It seems like everyone likes her, and she likes everyone, but then you get to the sixth and final episode, and there is a quick comment by Montana that she likes everyone except Beth that's there, and then Beth chimes in, and kind of mentions that she's a little bit of an outsider and that's okay. And you don't see any of that on the season, but just the idea of her because of this injury on this season, the foreshadowing of, you know, of the fact that she's going to be this kind of antagonistic person for her team for better or for worse or fairly or unfairly. She's put in this kind of unfair position of my team's kind of upset at me and I can't do anything about it. And just the whole the whole saga of Beth starts on a on a very a note that makes sense given the the rest of the saga of Beth in the challenge. So love that it aged really well. As for what ages poorly, because again, it's 1999 reality television. There's some things that don't age super well. Um, None that are you know the real big warts of the show that'll come up in certain seasons over our time discussing all of them. But. Small stuff. Um, there's a bed race challenge where they have to, they're supposed to dress up for this particular challenge, and one team goes with uh, costumes being the village people, which includes a Native American person, and that costume, you know, it doesn't look so good nowadays. Um, then there's a, there's a weird, the initial scene of Montana and Noah flirting that eventually culminates in a Winnebago rendezvous later on, but. Um, the initial scene, there's kind of some flirting that leads to wrestling and some ripped underwear and shirts and talk of feminist and not feminist. It's, it's just kind of a weird scene. It was the only time of the whole show where I was like, I'm kind of getting a little cringy, but thankfully it ended really quick and it never got that that crazy. But that, that scene isn't the best looking back. And then the third and final one, they do a they do a show. Uh, kind of a variety show where they just get 10 minutes on stage in a hard rock hotel in Vegas to put on whatever show they want. Real World decides to do a spoof on a Jerry Springer show, and there is a coming out moment on it um, that I'm not actually sure if it ages bad or good or not at all because uh, like the two, I forget which two cast members it is, uh, but they kiss, everyone applauds, and it, you know, it is something that at that time you know was happening on a Jerry Springer and would be a big deal on the show, you know, and I don't know that I have the best feelings about that show and what it took advantage of and whatever, uh, you know, people's lives and what they're using the storylines, this, that, and the other. But that was a one moment where I was kind of like, Hmm, uh, I mean, that would actually, that could have gone really, really bad, but actually it kind of went okay. So those are the only ones that age really bad. And for the most part, again, very impressed and surprised to find out that, uh, this say this season as a whole, really aged pretty well and that there wasn't anything that had me going like, Oh yeah. If they do put this on Paramount plus maybe they drop an episode here or try to drop a scene here, this, that, or the other really, really overall for 1999 viewed even through 2022 lens uh, hats off to the whole cast for handling themselves like mature adults with that. Then we've aged the best and the worst. We've talked about some of the stories we've covered the basic stats Let's get into the true, true meat of this season, and we can only do so one way. There's only one way we do these things on the Challenge Story, and that's by handing out some awards. So it's time to get the hardware out and hand out our awards for this season. We've got to start this award ceremony off. We're going to hand out one, two, three, four, five, five awards plus culminate in the great final grade for the season. So kind of six in a way, but five awards. We got the best quote, the best daily challenge, the best moment, the best episode, and the very highly coveted season MVP, the second MVP ever in challenge history will be handed out momentarily. But first and foremost, we got to talk quotes because this season did give us, started to give us a much, much, much better slate of one-liners, in quotes to use still only six episodes. So not a ton of time. And as we discussed in the stats section, you know, I don't have the total confessional number in front of me, but the top two are 29, then 23, 23, and then a bunch of like 10 to 15. So 
you know, uh, like 150 confessionals, maybe not even like 120 confessionals total over the six episodes. Maybe not even that. I'm looking at the numbers again. A couple of them are way lower, almost non-existent. So uh, 29, 29, 23, 23, though, that's already at 100. So yeah, about like 130 total confessionals in six episodes. Uh, But we got some great quotes out of them. We will go in chronological order here real quick. First and foremost is Montana episode one, very near the beginning of the first episode. The the best moment of any of Mr. Big's time on this show is when Montana is cracking jokes at his expense and his suit's expense. So let's hear that one from her. Animals. Mr. Big, I think he should have been called like Mr. My suit is three sizes too big. Then to cap episode one. Post Beth's ankle injury, her team is feeling a little bit of a way about their luck to start this season and this challenge. And Nathan laments the injury and what it will and won't do for he and his team. Let's hear that one from him. Beth's still part of my team, but uh, she can't participate. I'm sorry. No, we should fly somebody in. There's a lot of money in stake here, and you know your ankle is going to get better, but my pocket's not going to get any bigger with your ass on the sideline. I'm not losing 40. Oh, no, no, no. Third nominee for quote of the season comes not from a cast member, but from a guest star, a cameo, and that is the one and only Kobe Bean Bryant. May he rest in peace. But yes, I I didn't I buried the lead a little bit, but I have referenced a few times already. And if you are following the social media channels, you know all too well because I went very, very in-depth um, with the scene. Kobe Bryant and Reggie Miller are in this season playing basketball versus Team Road rules while real world washes Kobe's dogs. But Kobe gets a nod for quote of the season when road rules, after unwilling to pay up post basketball game, they just run out of the gym. They run away when it comes time to pay up. And Kobe lets him know that's not something that he takes lightly being from Philly. I want to know when we're going to get paid. Well, like, time is money. You know, it took I me a lot to come out here. Y'all lost. We won. Money. Lost. Where is my money? We're going to give them a chance to uh, you know, come up with a decision amongst themselves. We're going to sit over here. We're going to chill. Okay. Uh, we won. Okay. All right. Y'all Hey, what's up? Hey. hey. You know where y'all going. Yeah, they can run, but they can't hide. I'm going to tell you like this. I'm from Philadelphia. We track people down. Fourth nominee, then going to be hard to beat Kobe, but fourth nominee, Neil is going to try the first of two nominations for Neil. Episode five, they're on the first obstacle course during the boot camp challenge. Neil actually does surprisingly well, given his sentiment going into the entire challenge, that boot camp challenge that is wanting to quit, deciding to do it. He does. He actually does a great job. His team, the rest of them, not so much. And he ends up getting, at one point of the challenge, a face full of his teammates' butt as he tries to help push them along. So let's hear him discuss that now. But hey, you know, I've got to do great things like crawl around in the mud while people are shot at. Shut up. Stop. You've made your point. I did get to sniff Janet's ass, (laughs) which has been one of the high points of the trip, and it came quite late. Not to be outdone Montana comes over the top later in that episode they pull up to the Playboy Mansion team real world has already been kind of embarrassed at the boot camp challenge as you just heard part of from Neil and Montana is already feeling down on her luck then they pull up to the Playboy Mansion of all places in the whole season she's had a little bit a chat here or there with different castmates notably Noah in particular about treating women more appropriately this, that, and the other on that topic. And so the Playboy Mansion and being greeted by a Playboy Playmate is not something that she is happy about or looking forward to, especially coming off of the embarrassment of the boot camp. So she's just had it, and she lets the producers know how she feels about the entire situation, and thankfully we get to listen in. To meet you. As if I haven't felt inadequate enough today, and now i got to deal with, like, fake boobs and airbrushing. I just say hi. Hi. But I'm thinking like, well, she may have bigger boobs than me, but I have a better ass, so whatever. <laughs> What's next? Why don't they just have the real world team lay down and everyone can pee on us? <laughs> That's it. I'm just, there just better be something else is all I got to say. 
That's going to be a hard one to beat, but the final nominee is going to try. It is Neil for the second time. This one, we get away from sniffing butts and peeing on people and get to a more wholesome commentary, and that is the end of the season. Neil, who has throughout the season not necessarily loved being there, uh, wanted to go home at a different point or two, not loved every challenge put in front of them, but he has enjoyed it. In the end, he admits he's had a great time. And he's gone from sad to glad. So let's hear that from him. There was so much richness in the whole experience. Makes me happy. I've gone from sad to glad. It's a tight race between the six of them. I'm desperate to give it to Kobe, just, you know, to give it to Kobe. But we got to go with Montana. Just lay us down and pee on us. Why don't you? I mean, just great, great stuff. Um, And just fit the moment really, really well and was great. Uh, So Montana gets the award for the best quote of the season. Moving on to the best daily challenge. And this one is not really close. I should state uh, quickly that the playing basketball versus Kobe Bryant and Reggie Miller is not a daily challenge. It was one of the mini challenges of it. So it is not up for this award. Otherwise, it certainly would have won more on that next award. Though for this one, the best daily challenge, you know, of the five, Uh, The talent show is pretty cool. We get the pressure of the live show the same way in season one. They perform at the Groundlings, and it was really cool just from the perspective of that's a whole different type of really, really difficult scenario than something athletic. Uh, The talent show is cool. It's fun. Live audience, all that, sure. The bungee jump is uh, our first ever heights over water in the series history. So that's kind of fun and just, you know, a a prelude to everything that would come, a staple of the challenge of become, you know, half of the challenges every single season have to be something about heights or water or both. So that's kind of cool. It has some historical weight behind it, but there's only one daily challenge that was going to ever win this award. And it's the first one of the season. The roller derby is fucking insane, yo. I mean... To say, uh, to say that the show wasn't physical in the early days and that it was all the, you know, the carnival games, as the Godfather and others like to say from time to time, is just flat out false. Because, yes, some of them were much more silly. The bed bug challenge or the bed run whatever challenge is a little silly. Um, the bungee jump isn't all that you know physically taxing. It's basically, it's just not. The talent show is a whole different thing. It would be something great to bring back. Um, you know, all the boot camp is a little bit closer to what we'd be accustomed to today of, you know, like actual, like little obstacle courses and things, but the roller derby is a real roller derby. And if you've never seen a roller derby, like the actual sport, uh, I behoove you to look up some, some YouTube clips and whatnot. They basically, the, the game is that the teams on roller skates around a small circular rink. They all start in the same position at the start line and they start skating in circles. And the goal is that certain people on your team are trying to lap the entire other team. They're trying to go out fast, get in front and lap people. Meanwhile, everyone else basically wrestles to not let those people buy them and to hold other people up. It gets very physical. It gets very gruesome. It's people on roller skates basically wrestling. It's insane. And they make these poor people do this with no experience. Half of them don't seem to know how to skate going in. My heart's pounding the whole time I'm watching it. I am someone that doesn't know how to uh, almost never roller skated, ice skate, anything like that. I would have been terrified if I was them. We get our first ever injury out of this with Beth hurting her ankle. It's just intense and brutal. And most importantly, there is a live audience. They have a grandstand of people, and I just, I will pay any amount of money. I said it on both Twitter, Instagram, called out Buna Murray, Mark Long, others that are in charge behind the scenes of the show. I don't know how it's possible with the way they film these things, but there's got to be a way to allow a live audience. I know we have cell phones, you know, iPhones now and social media, and we could just, you know, be Snapchatting or Instagram Live or whatever the whole time find a way, get those little bags that some, you know, musicians and comedians use where you lock your phone while you're at an event, do that. And let me come watch a daily challenge or an elimination in person. Cause it's unbelievable. The crowd's going insane. It's vicious. It's brutal. And just again, yeah. Um, it, the, those that say, you know, now we got hall brawl and things like that. This is just as dangerous, if not more, because everyone is involved in anything they do nowadays, which they do a plenty of dangerous and brutal and physical stuff nowadays. A bunch more of it. The quantity is much higher, but they they did it back then. So the roller derby, that's the best daily challenge of this season by a long shot. 
Then we come to the best moment of the season. Probably, you know, the season MVP is the most prestigious of the awards we've got. That's like the best picture at the Oscars for sure. Um, But the best moments kind of, you know, even more than the best episode, uh, which usually goes in line with the best moment. Um, That's a little more like a director and script type if we keep that Oscars metaphor going uh, poorly as it may be at this point. But the best moment's a big, big award. And we've got five nominees for this particular season. Let me get my notes moved down here so I can see them all and decide which order I want to go in here. We're going to start with one, the best, Bessie the Winnebago. Bessie the Winnebago. So this season, they they both have to travel by, they, you know, they're traveling road rule style still, but the winning team, which is almost the entire time, uh, road rules and actually the one time real world wins is when they don't currently have a Winnebago to travel. And so everyone travels in the same one. Um, but they got their nice tour van, but the losing team almost always real world is traveling in a busted up Winnebago that they named Bessie. Bessie only lasts two and a half episodes. She makes a brief comeback appearance in episode six, but the three different moments of Bessie the Winnebago all rolled into one is kind of a best moment nominee. That would be the first episode when they spray paint Bessie, the entire outside, the real world team spray paints, gives her a complete makeover, complete graffiti over, if you will. Then there is a moment where they get pulled over to end the second episode, and it's a, it's a whole thing. Um, it could have been in the age best or worst possibly category, um, just the fact that Going along the highway, doing nothing wrong. Just the appearance of the van gets them pulled over by a state trooper. They're eventually let go. But that leads to Bessie won't start. And they're stranded by the side of the highway. That entire scene is is crazy and wild and indicative of, you know, um, what they had to do, the cast had to do back in this season when they're driving it themselves. Nathan's the one driving when they get pulled over. He doesn't have his license on him. It's a whole thing. Um, But then she doesn't start. And then later in episode six, Bessie comes back and the entire team blows her up, literally uh, blows her up. Just they, it's not the ideal way to dispose. If you're going to impound a Winnebago, you don't blow it up into a bunch of pieces everywhere that someone has to pick up, but that's what they get to do as a team. So the entire arc of Bessie should be lamented as a best moment candidate. Next one, at the Vegas talent show, while everyone's wonderful, everyone is entertaining, and Real World eventually gets the one win of the season for them, <laughs> what the performance Kefla, uh, Kefla, excuse me, and Mark, uh, those two in particular, Kefla, I believe, probably doing a uh, James Brown impersonation, maybe, <laughs> if not just a doing a song and dance thing, a scream and dance type of thing, number going on, and then Mark right after him doing his kind of hype man, B-boy, just, yeah, boy, shirt off, does a road rules chant. It's hilarious. It's wonderful. It's it's just everything. Um, and so that moment in particular is definitely a moment of the season nominee for me. Then is from our kind of sliding into our slot for the kind of most uh, – Actually, two. I, I forgot one here, and I'm going to have to give two different nominees here. Um, first one, from both filling the kind of real, raw, genuine, we don't really get quite this level of uh, real-world, real-life, genuine type of conversation anymore these days that we did originally on these shows. First one goes to Nathan and Callie. Uh, a very sad uh, discussion, but of po- past trauma, but again, just real raw three minutes long in the end, which is another part that we just wouldn't happen on today's show. Even with way more runtime, they don't really let that type of moment breathe the way they do in this one where the two of them both learn that they've each lost a parent early in their life and discuss how that affected them, how they dealt with it over the years, wh- how it still affects them in that day. And it bonds them together in that that little conversation is just, again, hats off to the production team of like, yes, this is as interesting as anything. I know it can be a little hard to watch. It's really sad what they're talking about. They're talking about real trauma in their lives, but it's that raw, real stuff that made the real world originally such an unbelievable smash phenomenon hit. And there's those moments of it still in the early seasons of the challenge for sure. That was one. That's a nominee. The other one, similar on a somewhat similar note, is the post-breakfast smoke break that the real world team takes during the boot camp. 
uh, challenge. Neil has wanting to quit. He's you know from across the pond. He's over here. He doesn't totally agree with war or military in general. He certainly doesn't agree with the mil- uh, U.S. military's kind of ethos or you know any, anything to do with them. He doesn't like being on the military base. He doesn't want to be around what he, as he says, routinely killing machines people. That's only job is to kill other people. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He tries to quit. He's talked into staying by one of the. Uh, I don't. I don't want to get rank wrong with sergeants or whoever the guy, the guy, the main military personnel who is kind of in charge of their little challenge. But then they have a breakfast as a team. They take a little smoke break post breakfast, sit on a table, and they talk it out a little bit about his like why he feels that way. Um, and everyone kind of shares whether they agree or don't disagree or disagree. And Nathan, who is in the reserves at the time and has a little bit of a military background is, you know, stands by him is like, Hey, we support you. If you want to leave, if it gets to be too much for you, you want to peace out. We don't care if we lose, we're behind you. But that entire little couple minute, of uh, Neil expressing his feelings on where they are and the people they're interacting with and the situation that they're kind of living out. That's all that, again, in that kind of real, raw, genuine vein that doesn't necessarily get the time to breathe if it even happens at all in the newer versions of the show. So that's a nominee. Final two nominees then, Janet and Jason. The whole season, starting in episode one, it's a will they, won't they. They clearly are going to, but more of a when will they get together and consummate their flirtation and the little relationship they got brewing and we get all the way to episode six. They're at the Playboy Mansion, and we and we think everyone, anyone that's trying to hook up, this is the time to do it. You've got the grotto right there. You're all staying in this nice little guest house, this, that, and the other. The season's over tomorrow. And for a moment, we think, oh, Janet and Jason didn't finally get together. Man, thought that was going to happen. But then production pulls them aside for a little confessional the next morning and says, hey, uh, so what went down on the tennis courts out there last night, Jason? And Jason's like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Janet can't keep a straight face. She just loses. Is like, how did you catch me? You got to at least tell me if you guys catch that. So we don't see anything, which is respectful of the production. But we do know they were tipped off that Janet and Jason uh, had a little fun on the tennis courts at the Playboy Mansion and their reactions when they're confronted about it in their little standing confessional the next morning right after getting up are hilarious um in that entire moment is just great great fun and the culmination of a season long uh season worth of fun interactive moments between those two final nominee though for the best moment is obviously the one that's going to win and that's kobe kobe is here reggie miller is here kobe's here reggie's here how in the hell this happens i do not know should be shouted out cyrus is here as well uh, challenge all-star OG Cyrus comes into referee when they come to a mini challenge and find out that one team has to play Kobe Bryant and Reggie Miller in six on two basketball. It is unbelievable. It is so great. I shared basically the entire thing in clip form on both Twitter at Jacob Hobla and challenge historian Instagram. So if you want to see the highlights that Kobe puts on because he puts on a performance. Reggie does a great job too, but Kobe puts on a full Kobe Bryant experience show. The turnarounds, the baseline drives, the dunks in traffic, the whole thing. It is amazing. Uh, As you heard, he was nominated for quote of the week, but I just can't believe that this is a thing that happened on a season of the challenge. This could never, ever, 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 ever happen in today's world. Um, Not just Kobe Bryant, I was passed away tragically, Uh, along with daughters and friends uh, last year. So rest in peace to them. But uh, not just Kobe Conan or Reggie Miller wouldn't come back, but like no NBA player of any stature is coming back and being on the challenge and anywhere now, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I don't know how they even pulled this off 23 years ago, what the payment was to get them on, what the benefits were offered to get them on. If Kobe and Reggie maybe were just big fans somehow, um, except they couldn't have been because it was in the second season. No one knew what the challenge was, um, but we did find out Kobe was a fan of the real world when he and Nathan talk about what's going on with Nathan because Kobe loved his season. Um, everything about it, again, the highlights are on the Instagram page. It's amazing. It would be, you know, it's, I guess, a precursor to the Champs vs. Pros spinoff season that we get 
basically two decades after this, um, a little under two decades after this. But even then, when we did that, a full season where they could win money for charities and have all this exposure, and the show was a big, big hit 20-some seasons into it, and it was still getting, like, retired, not that big of names of, you know, the X Games or the NFL or whatever. We weren't getting prime all-star nearly soon to be NBA champion Kobe Bryant and Reggie freaking Miller. So that entire scene, just unbelievable. And I can't believe that they got to do that. And just amazing. That's, that's the moment of the season. I am biased, obviously big basketball nerd over here, but uh, I think without a doubt, that's still (laughs) the moment of the season. It's incredible television. Even the, the portion of it, that is the real world team washing Kobe's dogs of which there's five or six, at least um, (laughs) that they have to take and get groomed and washed. Uh, That content's even great. So that's the best moment of the season. Which brings us to our final two awards. The best episode in the season MVP. As far as the best episode goes, uh, it's a runaway. It's episode three because Kobe, I mean, <laughs> we just talked about I'm, I'm super duper biased, but I, also, I actually do think the third episode uh, titled, if I can pull it up here, Getting Drunk, horrible title. The, the only one that doesn't make sense as a title either. I don't think anyone gets drunk on it, but the one where they play Kobe Bryant and Reggie freaking Miller in basketball. Um, that one got the highest grade, an A minus grade of the season. Um, and so tied for the highest. Actually, gave episode two an A now that I'm looking at it. But that's kind of the saga of Bessie gets made over, pulled over, broken down. I'm still giving it to episode three. I just can't give it to anything else. It, it has the Kobe Reggie game. It that moment will is the first in the ongoing building of the greatest moment in challenge history bracket, which the actual official challenge Instagram, social media pages and, you know, production or whatever put out recently a bracket of the greatest challenge moments that if I'm being honest, was a bit atrocious as to what they picked and didn't pick for that bracket. So I'll be doing my own at the very end, three months or so from now of this entire rewatch. And this is the first moment that will be on that bracket. So Episode three gets the award for the best episode of the season. As for the MVP, which we did, there's a lot of debate here at Challenge Historian HQ. Could Kobe Bryant and Reggie Miller win the MVP off of a six-minute performance? We decided no. It does need to go to a cast member in the end. So it's honestly a little bit hard, as this was a pretty balanced showing across the board. There was really, I mean... Annie really doesn't get a whole lot of time until she breaks her ankle at the Playboy Mansion in the final episode, but otherwise it's kind of not shown a whole bunch. Noah gets a bit less uh, attention than the rest, but really across the board, like Mark, Mark has some moments, Beth has some moments, Janet and Jason for sure, Neil for sure, Montana for sure, and really uh, it comes down to Nathan for sure. Really, Montana, Neil, and Jason are the final three. They're in the top three on the ballot. And, you know, based the confessionals are a big indicator of this, of who's kind of telling the story of the season and who is a part of all the big stories of the season. And I'm really torn between Neil or Jason uh, on my ballot. I wish I could almost put them as a tie, but I can't. There's only going to be one MVP for every single season. We have to name one. And so in a very, very close race, just by a vote or two amongst the big sprawling committee, we're going to go with Jason. Jason is the the MVP of the season. Jason Cornwell from Real World Boston uh, over Neil, which is, is tough. It was a really, really difficult decision over Montana, who definitely makes a run at the award. But Jason got two of the six episodes, was the episode MVP to Montana and Neil's one. Um, and just hit him and Janet – their entire flirtation and little moments here and there and discussions and whatnot are prevalent in almost every single episode. He, he just kind of is the most seen, the most, you know, high mo- positive moments, bringing the most value by a smidge over Neil or Montana. So congrats. The second ever season MVP award goes to Jason joining Cynthia in the annals of challenge history. Now, with that, we've handed out all the awards, talked through a lot of stuff from this season. There's one final thing we must do, and we've put Jason officially in 
the Hall of Fame. We've put the Kobe Reggie Miller basketball scene in the Hall of Fame. We've put episode three as the best episode of the season. But we've got to grade the season as a whole so that when we are done with this 37 or more season rewatch journey, we can appropriately look back and say, where do all of the seasons rank versus each other? So we've got to hand out a grade. So let's do that now before we get out of here. Final season grade, season two, Real World Road Rules, the challenge, challenge, Real World Road Rules versus challenge, whatever you want to say, Real World Road Rules challenge, season two, some would say season one, as previously covered. Uh, A bit of a breakdown of the grade before we get to the overall grade. Um, Keep track here to kind of try to put my all of my high-level thoughts in order before I come up with the actual grade for the season. I break down a grade for the female cast, for the male cast, for the sport, and the show. Obviously, the show throughout its history is broken up half female, half male. They split it down the middle. Um, and so I like to kind of grade the cast. Instead of one cast grade, I split the cast up into the two. And then, as I've talked about many, many times before, and will continually reference and talk about many, many times in the future. I always think of the two pillars of the show being the sport and the show itself, the kind of the contest side of things and the reality television drama side of things, the sport and the show. So that's the four grades. Female cast, I'm giving a B plus, very, very good job on the female cast uh, with this season. A lot of big hitters, a lot of grade A content. Just a couple of them, you know, not making a big, big impact. Um, so we keep keep this one out of the top, top tier of the A world. But a B plus for the female cast. On the male cast, an A. Uh, it can't really be anything else. Every All six of them have moments throughout. Um, and, you know, even if really... Uh, Nathan has a little bit of a run on the challenge. Mark obviously has a big, big, big outsized influence on the challenge. Um, so they go on anything, but even, you know, Neil, Jason, Kiefla, Noah, they all make an impact on the season. They're all great casting. It makes, it makes sense. The mix of all the men and the women here make a lot of sense. So B plus and a for the female and male casting grades, respectively, the sport grade, a C plus, the show grade a B plus. There was a lot of good show elements, a lot of good dramatic reality elements. The sport itself had a, a higher two with the roller derby and playing Kobe and Reggie in basketball, but also had some, you know, uh, a little bit lower level type of stuff, more of the carnival games that were, you know, grade well on the show portion, but not as much on the sport portion. So a B plus and a, a C plus and a B plus all leads to an overall grade of a B, a solid B, which as we talked about, if you didn't listen to the season one podcast recap, we're a tough grader around here. A territory, anything in the A range, that's that's all time stuff. That's top tier, top shelf, high dollar, high ticket item, the best of the best. Anything in a B is a really, really good season, really high quality season. C is like, ah, you know, it's forgettable, but it didn't, you know, it didn't ruin the show. It didn't push anything backwards. D range is where it's like you almost ended the franchise as we know it so that's a little bit of a high level over so a b a very good score a very good season of the challenge um really starts on a real high it kind of has a lull episode three four or or four five range is kind of a little bit of a lull of a six episode season but still a short run two hours total runtime for the whole entire season basically the length of whatever this podcast has ended up being at this point so a B for the season. We'll see where that puts it amongst the ranks of all seasons in general when we get to the end of this long, long, long process of rewatching all 37 seasons, plus maybe some spinoffs. But that is season two, Real World Road Rules Challenge. That is all for this podcast. Thank you so much for listening along today and every day that you do. I really, really, really can't explain how much I appreciate the support that this show has gotten in its really first year. We're coming up uh, here on a month or two away from a year on the map, a year of putting out podcasts. So that's exciting. And it means the world that any single person has listened to any single episode and a bunch of you have listened to a bunch of them over and over and over. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for being here. We will be back again next week, as we said, on Monday and Thursday with seasons three 
and for Extreme Challenge, Challenge 2000, two fantastic seasons. We're going to see if I can uh, stop being a Kyle and actually pull my weight in this alliance because these are not six-episode seasons. They are 12 or 16 or a lot longer. So I got a lot of work ahead of me this week, and I'll be binging a bunch. I hope you fire up that Paramount Plus account and binge some seasons yourself whatever you end up doing have a wonderful weekend thank you for being here follow us on instagram at challenge historian hit that follow subscribe button wherever you're listening to this podcast and i will talk to you after the weekend ends peace